Um, this is something of a gear change from this presentation. It's, uh, um, and I've come from CCFE, which is um, part of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. We are the UK's National Fusion Energy Research Lab. Um, and the work I'm presenting is very much um, on behalf of all of our partners in, within Amaze. And so I, I can take neither all the credit nor all the blame for, for what comes in the next few minutes. Um, we are something of an odd oddity within the Amaze Consortium in that we, lots of the other partners, certainly the end users, um, are looking at building components which are, already have a solution. They're conventional parts for, for aerospace or for, for industry, whereas for us, we have a, a problem which we can't yet solve and which additive um, provides um, an interesting option for looking at whether we can, we can meet some of those challenges um, and um, overcome some of those challenges using the distinct advantages that additive has. So just going through my talk, um, just because I'm aware that not everyone is very familiar with what fusion energy is, what fusion power is, I'll give a very brief overview. Uh, do catch me afterwards. I can bore you for hours on end and be enthusiastic, but I'll try and give a, a brief overview. I'll, look, I'll talk about some of the particular challenges of designing components for fusion, um, why we're looking at additive, again, some of the techn techniques um, and some of the results we've, we've used or, and got over the course of the last uh, four and a half or so years, um, some of the high, high heat flux testing, some of the more exciting results we've got, and then talk very briefly about looking forward um, at how we might carry on using AM for fusion. So first of all, what, what is fusion power? Um, my answer for my six-year-old daughter is I, I put the sun in a box. That's my job. Um, we're building the box. We're, we're recreating the reaction that powers the sun on Earth. Um, most simply, we're putting two hydrogen isotopes together to make helium. We release very high-energy neutrons. We trap those neutrons, heat water, turn turbines. So in many ways, it's a, a very simple reaction. Um, the advantages are very simple. Um, the, the raw fuel, the hydrogen isotopes that we're, we're using are very abundant. Um, the raw materials we need are deuterium um, and lithium to breed tritium. For, I won't go into the details there, but um, the, the abundance and the, the energy density of the fuel means that for a, a lifetime supply, these, these numbers are things in the air, you, you basically need two bathtubs full of water and one lap, laptop battery. So in terms, it's not renewable, but it's effectively um, pretty unlimited in terms of supply. Um, the, as I've said already, we're producing helium. So in terms of the reaction itself, there's no um, long-term nuclear waste. Um, and if you build your power plant carefully, you pick on materials carefully, um, you can make sure that everything is recyclable within 100 years and you have no high-level waste at all, um, certainly not over any significant amount of time. Because, again, because of the energy density, because of the way we're doing this reaction, there is no chain reaction. This is a hard thing to do to start. It's a hard thing to continue. So there's no, ris no risks, unlike fission, of the reaction getting out of control. Um, and because, again, it's a very low, um, low quantity of material you're using, there's not a very small quantity of stored energy in any power station. So it is um, inherently safe. It's inherently clean. There's no carbon emissions as well. Um, and we're looking at very abundant fuel. So it's, it's one of those things where if we can do this, it's absolutely worth doing. Um, and it's one of the best things about working at CCFE is everyone realizes that we're, we're working towards something which is worthwhile. And the question that, that everybody asks at this point is, OK, you've been promising this for a very long time. When is it going to happen? Where are you at? Um, and for me, we're at a very exciting time with infusion research. Um, if you go, we work particularly on magnetic confined fusion, which means we take a, a relatively large um, volume of low dens density gas we turn it into a plasma, and we have the reaction in a plasma. So it's magnetically confined fusion. We use uh, the, the leading concept, the most advanced concept. It's called a tokamak. Uh, it looks like this. It's a magnetic bottle, basically, a donut-shaped magnetic bottle. Um, going left to right, um, the first two machines there, um, not to scale, but um, you can see this sort of yay big. There's a person there. You get some idea of the scale. Um, the person is this sort of size, sort of half the height of mast. Um, these are machines that have been built already. Jet's been operating since the 80s. Um, Mast is, has been operating since slightly more recently, has just undertaken a large upgrade, just about to restart. So these are machines which are running. We do fusion every day when it's operating. We can make the reaction happen. Fusion is mundane in that respect. 
but they are fundamentally research machines. And so we are at, in, in terms of these, we're at the stage, like I said at the bottom, so feasibility research. Can we make this happen? Is, is fusion something we control, we can, can run for, for sensible periods of time? But it's a, it's a physics experiment. It's, a, it's got a large amounts of engineering support, but it's a fundamental experiment. Um, moving forward from there, we're looking, uh, in the south of France, we are currently building um, the ITER project, which is something that is um, funded by about half the world's population. And it's been, um, it's under construction at the moment. Um, it's the last bit of detailed design are ongoing, but it's basically, it's all there. Um, and that is, because of the scale of it, will take probably another 10 years to finish off building by the time it's fully operational. Uh, it's, it's kind of power station scale machine, arguably the most complicated machine ever built. Um, it's gonna take a while to put it together and get it, to get it up and running properly. Well, so that is a proof of principle machine, power station scale under construction. But the proof of principle is not good enough. We actually need engineering demonstrators. We need something that we can say, this is commercially viable. It's worth doing on a commercial scale. It's worth the, the costs, are, I'll talk more about in the slide, the costs are appropriate, reliability is appropriate. And that is um, the generic term for that suite of that generation of machines, which is demo. Um, there will almost certainly be several demo machines. There's a fairly well-developed European design. That's a, a concept cartoon of a demo, European demo machine. Um, and the Amaze project is coming in at that point. We're looking at designing components for demo. The detailed design, as I said, for ITER is done. So we're saying, how can we build components which will go into an dem uh, engineering demonstrator? Um, the concept designs are beginning to be there. Detailed designs will be starting uh, as ITER comes online. So we're trying to do things as much as in, in parallel as possible, but we need some of the results from ITER to be able to do a proper design for, for demo. So building these components, contributing to the design of demo. Um, demo itself has to demonstrate the commercial viability of fusion energy. We don't want something that just produces power, but it's so expensive and so unreliable it's not worth doing. We have to, to show that the facility um, has a reasonable build time and a reasonable cost. Cost of electricity has to be competitive. And then you have to, it has to be um, reliable, maintainable, safe, all those sorts of things. Uh, that's the real challenge. And I think that's the biggest risk for fusion. It's not the physics anymore. It's the, is it worth doing? Is it, can we get a good engineering machine? And so materials and manufacturing are the big challenges for fusion now. Within a maze, we're focusing on some of the most challenging components and um, the plasma facing, those internal wall surfaces, which have to survive very high heat loads, um, up to tens of megawatts per square meter. Um, they have to maintain structural integrity. They have to offer resistance to those high energy neutrons. Um, and then they have to provide minimal impurities to the fusion plasma. As I said, getting this reaction to carry on going is challenging. We have to have a very pure um, deuterium tritium plasma, any impurities, and the reaction stops. So we have to have a very high integrity, very challenging design of these components. And so we at CCFE are focusing within a maze on enhanced solutions to those plasma-facing components to increase um, the life, lifetime between replacements, so the reliability, availability of demo can increase. Um, we want to operate at more elevated temperatures, particularly coolant temperatures, so that plant efficiency can go up, so that cost of electricity can come down. Um, and we would like to be able to do in situ repair, um, because although long term there's no nuclear waste, those neutrons do activate internal wall components, so lots of the maintenance will have to be robotic. And so in situ maintenance of plasma facing components um, would increase that availability, maintainability, reduced costs um, for a fusion power plant. This is where additive manufacturing comes in. Now, Amaze, as you all know, has these goals of, of drawing on the, the latest developments in material science and manufacturing um, within additive manufacturing. So the, the benefits for us are the opportunity to mitigate property transitions. Um, these, sort of these high temperature components have um, materials which are traditionally very hard to join together, either through thermal mismatch or the, the things we want to, to reduce the number of joints because qualifying nuclear joints is incredibly challenging. We want to apply the, the novel materials and design for, for optimizing um, heat transfer, for the material strength, for all those kinds of engineering advantages, and as I said already, in situ repair. And additive manufacturing provides 
um, ways of, of addressing each of those needs along the way. So we're, we're taking the full suite of advantages of AM and applying it to a number of R&D challenges. Um, so within a maze, we are focusing on, um, just to set the bar as high as possible, the most challenging and one of the most critical components, which is called the diverter. It's a re region at the bottom of the, the vacuum vessel, the machine, which is effectively the exhaust port. It extracts heat and, ex and waste gases produced by the heat fusion reaction. It minimizes contamination, and it protects the sur surrounding walls from the thermal and, and neutron loads. And so we set at the beginning of the project some, some goals, some design requirements. Um, I said tens of megawatts per square meter. We, depending on whether the plasma physicists sort themselves out, we might be able to reduce that down a little bit. Um, let's say five megawatts per square meter steady state for about 6,000 cycles. Um, and un more unconventionally within the fusion community, we said we want a 600 degree coolant. We want really good thermodynamic efficiency for, um, for the plant as a whole. Um, lots of what you will have seen over the course of today has been, been saying, well, AM produces inherently rough parts, and we want to do some post-processing finishing. But for us, where we're looking at thermofluid um, aspects, a rough internal surface can actually increase heat transfer coefficients. So we're looking at um, drawing on that inherent advantage and, and exploit the roughness due to AM for, for heat transfer. Um, lots of the materials we're looking at are expensive, so reducing waste. Um, and um, in decommissioning, um, again, we want to reduce the amount of, of waste we're decommissioning. Um, but we, one of the real benefits is these, this freedom of geometry, um, where traditionally we've had just pipes, simple big pipes with stuff stuck on the outside or very heavily machined parts. We want to use the advantages of, of novel, um, novel geometries, th particularly uh, thermofluid geometries and fabrication techniques um, to give that thermal efficiency and enhanced integrity. Um, to that end, we've used... Um, both powder bed and wire arc processes, um, laser powder bed, electron, um, electron melting. Um, and you will have heard, and you will hear again, uh, more details of those. I won't go into any more details. Just to... But um, so the, we've looked at a number of different materials, different processes, um, starting off with um, the guys from Erlangen, um, who we, we would like to use these very high temperature materials, but actually we'd quite like to compare to the more conventional options. Um, and copper is one of the, the baseline materials that is used for, for ITER and, and may be used in demo. And so we're starting with that and saying, well, let's, let's do, rather than jumping head all the way, let's start with copper and tungsten, which we use already, um, and build conventional parts, and then make additive parts, and then make complex additive parts, and compare that progression and see what the advantages are along the way. And so Alanga has, has done exactly that for us. We've got an um, electron beam melted copper block and a conventional copper, copper block, um, both with conventional tungsten tiles. Um, and then we have a, what's called, we call it a millipipe geometry. Um, the, the copper block on the top there is just literally a drilled hole, um, whereas the one at the bottom has multiple small channels going through it. You can have a look down, downstairs later on. Um, and then we are adding additive tungsten on top of that um, as a further progression so we can have a fully additive solution. For the other powder bed processes, we've got um, Birmingham have been working on tungsten and molybdenum. Um, tungsten, we'd hoped to be able to use a, a structural material to do that same um, millipipe geometry in, in tungsten as, as we did in copper. Um, we've got builds, uh, they've had success with the builds um, for, in terms of armor use, but the structural integrity is still too challenging. Um, and we haven't had an ability to, to really get the, the cracking and the porosity down to a level where we're comfortable to, to do high heat flux testing. And so we're using the, the powder bed material, but only for the armor for now. Um, and then molybdenum, which we were going to use again as a structural material, it's just not, we haven't reached a point yet where we're confident. We've made significant steps forward over the last few years, and I think they're, they're not unsurmountable. But um, within the scope of a maze, we've said, oh, we've, we've made progress, but we're not there for doing, um, for confident integrity for high heat flux testing yet. Um, we talked about um, in situ repair, um, and wire arc processes are one of those things that, that might be a possible solution for that. The tungsten armor on the tops of these surfaces is eroded, and the ability to potentially replace that in situ using something like WAM um, is very appealing. 
And so Cranfield have worked on that. Um, the tungsten, also looking at um, tantalum, molybdenum, and other, other refractory materials, um, potentially for, for grading. Um, we have some um, high heat flux wound tiles, which are about to be abrased to the copper substructures, which will do some high heat flux testing for comparison with the powder in the conventional. It's nice. For all of these things, we can have that progression between this is completely conventional through to um, fully AM. And that's where we really we gain. We can say these are the advantages, these are the drawbacks. Um, one of the things that I said earlier on was joining different materials together and the functional grading that is possible through um, AM is something that we really wanted to see if we could exploit. And although we haven't employed it in our demonstrators, and we've had some very nice um, results from Cranfield, um, moving very smoothly from a tantalum substrate to a molybdenum, um, to a tungsten armor. Um, and that the, the stresses of the joints between there would be reduced. There's um, significant advantages there. Um, and they're working on reducing that, um, the distance um, over which that functional grade exists. Um, so it's a, it's a nice result, but it's, a, it's sort of one of the sort of side benefits that we're looking at exploiting going forward. Um, combining materials, we'd, we'd hoped to be able to do it a direct um, one on the other um, deposition. But for the purposes of being able to do those comparisons, um, we've, we've optimized a brazing process. That's a not optimized brazing process on the top there. You can see the holes. But we've got a, a good, reliable brazing process um, using our in-house expertise between copper and tungsten. Um, that's enabled us to, to produce a, a range of high heat flux demonstrators. Um, and the bottom there, you can see a cross-section through one of these demonstrators. Um, one of the goals of Amaze was to do some um, real-world testing. Um, one of the challenges for fusion is the only way to really properly test uh, parts for a fusion power plant is to build a fusion power plant. And we couldn't do that within the scope of our budget. Um, and but there are other more traditional high flux testing. We use electron beam and um, ion beam testing quite ex extensively. But we looked again at the budgets and said, well, these are very expensive ways of doing this high heat flux testing. Could we, within the scope of a maze sort of, uh, supported by uh, CCFE technology program funding, could we make our own facility for doing, um, for making a facility which is really tailored for testing of these kind of advanced concepts that we're developing during a maze? Um, and out of that has come Hive, um, heating by induction to verify extremes. It was thought up on a trip up to, to the MTC a, a few years ago, but it's the closest we could come up with. And it's, as I said, it's a new facility um, using a range of off-the-shelf subsystems to produce a very high power. Um, as a minimum uh, 5 megawatts per square meter on a 50 by 50 millimeter tile. Um, factory acceptance, we've got up to close to 30 megawatts per square meter on a smaller tile. So we can really, it's a high performance facility, um, potentially. And we have um, high pressure, high temperature water system. We haven't aimed at that 600 degree coolant for this because actually it's not, it's not worth, we want to be able to test um, quickly and simply without, and, and affordably, and we can still get those direct comparisons usefully out of a, um, out of a water cooled system. Um, and the whole thing's done in vacuum, so we're avoiding, avoiding oxidation, reducing um, convective heat transfer um, from the, out, the air. And it's, it's a nice little similar to the fusion environment as far as you can do um, facility. And it's uh, very flexible. We can turn over samples and do repeat testing very quickly, um, get a sample in and out in a day as opposed to several weeks in a more expensive facility. Um, so the exciting stuff is, a, is data. This is a fairly typical uh, 2 megawatt per square meter pulse. Um, with some thermocouple traces. Um, and we've been able to do those direct comparisons and the quick data crunching between these conventional and AM samples. Um, we've done um, some testing on the electron beam copper samples. This is a trace from that. And we've got um, uh, in situ IR camera for um, assessing the, how well we're applying the heat flux. Um, we're doing, sorry, I should have said earlier, um, applying it with an induction heating system. Um, limiting, we're not very high temperature operation because of or using copper, because of using water. We want to avoid boiling or um, the stresses there. But it's a, it's a nice um, representative comparison between these components. 
Um, and what we've done is we've done a parametric um, ANSYS study of looking at varying material properties, varying heat transfer coefficients, um, varying heat fluxes, um, and compared that to the data we've got out for the AM and the conventional samples. Um, with, a, with a little bit of a squint, you can see that the lines lie reasonably nicely for um, if we take um, an enhanced heat transfer coefficient, that seems pretty clear. We're getting up to 20% better heat transfer with the AM samples and because of that roughness. That ties fairly well with the theory for a rough pipe. Um, but um, because of some of the challenges with the E-beam copper, we've got um, less than ideal thermal conductivity in the material. Um, and again, that ties up very nicely with the, the modeling. We've got some um, mechanical and thermal testing of that material, which was, is ongoing. And we're going to get that data out and uh, throw it back into the modeling and, and get more, uh, more confidence in those results. But it's a, you can see that um, the AM doesn't behave as well as the conventional for this particular sample. Example, but that's again assuming a very conventional design. The millipipe geometry should should behave much better than that. Um, looking forward, um, this is for us really a toe in the water for AM, and uh, it's a good way of us saying this is. It seems to have some clear benefits. Let's push forward within the fusion community and promote AM. We were, when we started with the maze, we were slightly coy with our our colleagues internationally. We, we didn't want to to be seen to be too unconventional. Um, but we've, the excitement has grown over the last five years. And more and more interest has come into AM across the field. Um, and so we, we're now left with a recognition that we need to, to look at these alloys, the, the material development, um, particularly focused to both AM and fusion. Um, we've got these high heat flux geometry concepts, which need to go beyond that very early prototype to a, a more realistic what would it look like if it was put in, in service? Um, that could be optimization both for the material use, for the, for the building, but also for the thermal fluid. Um, we want to characterize, qualify, validate all the processes. Again, it's a nuclear situation, so we want to qualifying AM for nuclear is um, as challenging, if not more so, than aerospace. Um, and as you will have heard time and time again over the last day, um, supply chain challenges getting particularly these more unusual materials, the refractory uh, tungsten, tantalum, molybdenum. Um, we want to have reliability in our, in our um, supply of those materials. I want to thank again our partners. Um, there's been a big team within CCFE over the last few years. It's definitely not been me. Um, Birmingham, Swansea, with material testing, along with the, the copper, have been um, done, I'd say, the bulk of the work. We have had often unrealistic demands, and I would like to thank them publicly. Um, as well as uh, helpful support from ESI and um, Airbus and uh, Polytechnic Torino. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? As I said, if you have any, do grab me afterwards. Oh, no. Two bathtubs of water and a laptop battery. Is it lifetime supplies? It's one of those numbers that is on all the kind of purgation <laughs> material. Um, it's, from my understanding, that's a kind of um, current um, average European energy requirement um, number. So it's uh, uh, per person. <laughs> Sorry, per person. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the, the other leading candidates are he, um, helium. Uh, so gas-cooled concepts are out there. Um, there are liquid metal options. Um, and, and otherwise, yeah, there's, there's not very many. Um, gas-cooled hydrogen helium, um, lithium potentially. Lithium has advantages because it, you breed tritium from it, so it's kind of in the vessel anyway. Molten salts, so building on some of the Gen 4 experience, potentially. <laughs>